So welcome everyone to the third Kudos Entrepreneurship Seminar. And today we have uh, John Haywood talking to us about uh, smart digital optics. So quite a different story, I think, to uh, Simon Poole's story uh, of how the company developed. John uh, was born in London, Canada. Uh, this is our education at the University of Waterloo. And an electrical engineer by trade. And uh, worked at the OTC uh, since 1990. I think started there before actually the PhD. And uh, he's uh, then uh, gone on to uh, do his PhD uh, at the University of Sydney. And in 2004, him and uh, four colleagues uh, founded Smart Digital Optics to commercialize the uh, research that we've been working on. And uh, he's going to tell us all about this, I guess. So welcome, John. Sure, thanks, Logan. And uh, thanks, everybody, for coming along. Listen, there are probably at least one or two of you out there that are saying, Oh God, not the current sensor again. I've heard this story for 20 years. But how do you think I feel? I've been having to give this talk for 20 years. When I was asked to give this talk, too, I thought, uh, oh, not another PowerPoint presentation. So I did whatever he does, and I went to Google and I typed in better than PowerPoint. It came up with this new presentation system called Prezi, so you can let me know how it goes. If you get a bit motion sickness in the middle, just let me know, I'll slow down. <laughs> so the title of my talk today is Smart Digital Optics, a successful startup. Uh, that title was given to me by whoever organized the seminar, it wasn't mine. Um, I would consider that we had successes, I wouldn't consider them as successful yet, until we have uh, sustainable positive cash flow, but here's the story. So, primarily what I've got here is the timeline, um, starting from what I've called the uh, pre-OFTC period, OFTC, CRC period, and the SDO period sort of like the anthropology or something, the pre-Mesozoic period, but uh, we don't go that far back. So a little bit of background for those of you who haven't been listening to this talk for the last 20 years. And uh, of course, we can blame all this on Michael Faraday, who back in 1845 came up with the uh, optical Faraday effect, which uh, we have uh, have used to measure current. So, of course, the, uh, the light traveling around the closed path, see the polarization state rotation, which is proportional to the current which that path encloses. So that's the basis of our optical current sensor. Moving on to the next moment in time, World War II. How does this fit in, you ask? We've got a quote here from Winston Churchill, which is, a, I think, inspiration to any entrepreneur. Never give up. And we'll see later on how that becomes important. And finally, to a more recent period, 1988, when the actual current sensor as we know it was born, so the, uh, the basic concept is a Sandiac interferometer built in fiber. We use a, a spun high by fiber so we can preserve uh, circular or elliptical polarization states. And in its basic form, the current then penetrates this loop <coughs> and causes a phase shift between the counter-rotating signals and the Sandiac interferometer. So in 1988, Ian Clark, who was a PhD student here at the university, 
was working on this project and realized that although that is able to sense current, it doesn't do a very good job because for very small currents, we're at stationary points on those fringe amplitudes. And so this topology doesn't really make a very good current sensor. And so his inventive step was to move from a 2x2 two two coupler to a 3x3 three three coupler. And so we, we now have the 3x3 three three Sandiac interferometer, again using spun high by optical fiber. Now we have a transfer function versus current where we have three signals and we never get all those currents, those signals stationary at any point. So we always maintain a more or less uniform sensitivity to current from very low currents to very high currents. So that uh, is the basis for the first patent that was developed, uh, which is classically known as OFDC-107, and the owner of that patent was the University of Sydney. So that completes the pre-OFDC period. <coughs> now on to the OFDC-CRC period. So following the grant of that patent, some very early field trials were, were run with that technology. So we have um, had TransGrid, who's the New South Wales Power Transmission Authority, uh, was very, very involved in the project, allowed us to use the site at Sydney West substation, which is out towards Penrith, for some field trials. And we installed uh, sort of three generations of progressive field trials over about a three year period from 95 to 97 but gradually improving technology. We soon realized that although that 3x3 Sandiac interferometer is good at measuring current, uh, we were relying very heavily on stable performance of the 3x3 coupler for accuracy of the system. And while in telecommunications you may be happy with a 0.1 or a 0.2 dB loss optimal component, the specifications that we're trying to reach here to be comparable with conventional current measuring systems is about 0.2% accuracy. And in terms of dBs, that's about 0.008% dB. So it's a very, very tight, uh, tight specification. And we realized that just by relying on the stable properties of that 3 by 3 coupler, we were going to get there. Um, so Ian Clark, sorry, Ian Bassett and I uh, had another inventive step, um, came across an idea by which we could um, interrogate our 3 by 3 coupler with what we call a NIMI technique. Um, so that stands for Network Independent Multiple Interrogation. So instead of just launching light in one arm of the coupler, we launched light sequentially into three arms of the coupler, got outputs from all three arms of the coupler, so this sort of time domain multiplexing system gives us nine measurements. And it turns out that we can process those nine measurements. It, in essence, it's almost sort of redundant information, but we can process it to eliminate the errors in the 3x3 coupler, and it turns out all of the errors in the, in the interrogating network as well. So that was, that was another breakthrough for the technology. And that uh, produced what we call CRC44. And that patent was owned by the Australian Photonic CRC. So continuing on in time, uh, after that patent, uh, we had well, a few more field trials, again using this new technology, larger scale, systems, three phase systems, uh, both for metering and protection, and those are very successful and are still, still in operation at Sydney Bus. And a number of awards that uh, were received for this technology. Um, 
and we did some independent laboratory testing outside of Australia with ABB, Sweden, and the United States. So now, we, we move into a more of a commercial phase, um, what I call the SDO period. And you'll notice that uh, from the very beginning of Ian Clark's PhD thesis, uh, we've now moved on about 14 years. So it's a long product development cycle. Beginning of this phase, then we started with, uh, and I, I guess really what the catalyst for this this whole company was a commercialization fair that we went to and presented a business plan to. Um, this was uh, Knowledge Commercialization Australia, and they invited companies or, or groups to present business plans, and they were judged. Uh, so we went to this fair, presented our business plan. And we came away with a small award in the engineering and manufacturing sector. So, with that award, I wanted to go out and have a few drinks. But Ian Bassett uh, was much wiser and said, no, no, we should spend this wisely. Um, so, we went and spoke to the uh, Australian Technology Park Innovations Group. And at that point, it was uh, Charles Lindoff who was in charge, and he suggested the Enterprise Workshop. Now, I don't know if anybody here has heard of the New South Wales Enterprise Workshop. Um, it's a program that is there to assist budding entrepreneurs. Um, they take in groups of four or five people um, in a team, and generally you're encouraged to come along with an idea for a company, and they will give you sort of courses, uh, evenings and weekends for a period of about six months on sort of the, the fundamentals of business and they will assign you a mentor to assist with development of your business plan and then that business plan as it evolves through that course is then presented to a group of a panel of judges a number of times <coughs> and fine-tuned. So if anybody here is considering uh, you know this sort of commercial activity I would very very strongly recommend being involved in that program it was an excellent program. So as well as the uh, learning that we got from that enterprise workshop, uh, the mentor that was assigned to us, uh, Peter Jansen, <coughs> was um, an excellent businessman, uh, very interested in um, assisting Australian business, uh, very keen to see groups like ours you know, for a good idea get off the ground. And so we worked with him for, for this period of six months. And at the end of it, he said, you know, I think this has legs. So I like this idea. I like where it's going. But you've got a big problem with intellectual property. So if you notice the first patent owned by University of Sydney, the second patent owned by the Platonic CRC, there was actually a patent in the middle, which was joint owned by the University of Sydney and ABD. So it was just it was quite a mess. And one of the first things that you, you find out when you're looking to get a business funded, the investor looks at the intellectual property because that's basically all that you have. Other than the people, you know, you've got that property. Um, how clean is it? What access do you have to that property? So we didn't. So he said to us, you know, I like this idea and I want to be involved, but you guys go ahead and straighten up that intellectual property and come back to you when you've done that. So that takes us on to our next phase then, where we started that intellectual property negotiation. Now, this was, was just a very bad luck, I guess, with our timing. Um, we started out when Australian Proprietary Limited had access to all this intellectual property. University of Sydney had licensed the two of them to be a clearing house for the, the intellectual property. And we started negotiations with them. Unfortunately, that was about the same time that the Proponic CRC was winding up. And the Australian Proponic Proprietary Limited went into administration. 
So while we started negotiating with Apple, all of a sudden we found out that Apple was no longer in charge, the administrator was in charge. So we moved on. Whole new negotiation. I think we've been, been at it for a year. Okay, throw all that away, start again with the administrator. So we started again, having an access with the administrator. About halfway through that process, the University of Sydney said, no, we don't like that anymore. Apple's gone bankrupt, we get our IP back. So then half the IP is going back to the university again. So this, this was, was a nightmare for us. Uh, one of the biggest, biggest challenges we faced. About that time, uh, we had uh, some interest from a venture capital company. Um, they were talking to Simon Poole. Simon Poole said, have you spoken to Smart Digital Optics? Um, so a uh, fellow from Smart Ventures came along and said, you know, what are you working on? We gave him our story. He said, look, um, we can't invest in you because you have nothing left property with a normal investment. But what we can do is give you a very small amount and we'll try and assist you in getting that intellectual property. We'll find some consultants that can manage that process, that know how to negotiate for that. Um, they can also help you write a business plan. So we registered an SDO. We took the small amount of funding from the venture capital group. And we completed our license negotiations then uh, with the University of Sydney. So in that period, the University of Sydney managed to get access to all of the intellectual property of the administrator, uh, and we managed to negotiate license for that. So that was uh, about another three-year period just to get to that stage. John, what is a small amount of money in your parlance? Uh, I, don't give us the number, just give us the number of digits, just to give us some idea. Oh, I think that was around 60,000. 60,000, okay. At that point, we were looking for an investment on the order of half a million dollars. So this is you know, roughly one tenth of what we're after. Okay. But it came with all sorts of conditions, like they wanted us to spend that money on the consultant to deliberate the IP and I write see. the business plan. It wasn't to pay off salaries. Okay. But so this idea that you're often told, if you don't quit your day job, you're not going to have the driving motivational force to make your company a winner. But well, if we don't quit our day jobs back here, there'd be no SDO. You know, so in our case, and this is not, of course, not a typical company, but in our case, um, I was doing consulting work, Ian Bassett was still affiliated with the university, Andrew Mitchell was a PhD student, and Bambi was working, he's the founder of the company. We all had other sources of income, and that managed to get us through this period where, you know, we were, we were fighting with intellectual property. Yeah. So I made up a little graphic here which sort of demonstrates the process that we were going through. Never really sure who was going to have the intellectual property next week. Um, you know, between the administrator, University of Sydney, and Apple, uh, shuffled around and we were trying to chase it, trying to find out uh, just who we would have to negotiate with next. So I've, I've incorporated a number of lessons into this talk. Um, Things that I think are important, but again, it's not really a typical company, so you can feel free to take these on board or, or ignore them. But I think this is a fairly fundamental one. If you have any control whatsoever in your intellectual property when it's being developed, try and keep the ownership simple. So in our case, where it was tied up between multiple parties, um, each with their own agenda, uh, each contract with, with different conditions attached to it, uh, it's nightmare. So try and, try and keep that IP ownership as simple and as clear as possible, and you'll save a lot of those headaches. So just look at this again now from the proof of concept when Ian Park first developed the idea of the 3 by 3 standing at the barometer to the point where we actually got this funded. 16 years. So again, that's atypical. Um, I hope nobody else has to go through that, but in our case, that was uh, that was how long it took. 
and in some ways that's why I included the uh, quote from Winston Churchill because I think that has uh, been you know, inspiration for us. Um, I've often uh, sort of come up with this thought is, am I being uh, persevered here or am I just being stupid? Um, at what point do you just give this up and say it's not like it happened? Okay, so following the license agreement, um, we had our colleague, well, this is, this is another interesting part of the story because um, we just finished that negotiation with, with Sydney University, got the license agreement, uh, and I thought, you know, Peter Jansen said give him a call when we had the IP straightened out. I should do that. So I'm looking around thinking, where did I put his phone number? And phone rang. Peter Jansen. He said, I just came across your business plan on my desk. I was wondering what happened to it. And it's just a remarkable coincidence. So Peter Jansen at that point said, yep, this looks good. Um, and he was willing at that point to put in some cash as well. Peter, you get, so Peter Jansen came about through this New South Wales Enterprise Workshop. Enterprise workshop. That's our mentor. We'll see, we'll see, where did he fit? Where did he get his money from? <coughs> he has... Um, a family business, uh, GTC Electronics. So he was now acting on his own independently, deciding that he wanted to invest. Yes. Yes. Um, he, had, he had been a mentor for the Enterprise Workshop previously for other groups. Um, so it was just a, a good goal thing that he was doing. Yeah, but I guess with the idea that he may have the opportunity to invest in, in some of these companies that came along, if he'd like to look at but he wasn't being paid by the Enterprise Workshop, it was just a, uh, you know, a good deed that he was doing. Um, and he, he likes telling the story of, you know, he gets calls regularly from the Enterprise Workshop saying, would you like to mentor another group? And he says, look, I'm not done with the last one yet. You know, Ten years later, we're still working with the one you gave, gave us. Uh, so he was, he was a, an excellent mentor. Uh, Excellent at uh, assisting us with, with some of our business plan development, the realities of business, uh, gave us a bit of cash, and also had really good connections in the, the BC world. So he could start introducing us then to the next round of funding. And I think that's, that's a pretty cool story in business is that you find an investor, and that investor then helps you find the next investor, and that one helps you find the next investor, and the ball keeps rolling. So each one has a, something at stake in the business they're interested in making sure that the business gets funded by the next investor. So he, he took on this role as our, our angel investor uh, and, and helped us to, to find the next round of investors. Now, in the middle here, um, while we were doing market research, following around to see who might be interested in you know, uh, optical current measurement technology, uh, what it might be used for, what the sort of market projections were. I got referred through about number four or five phone calls, different people saying, oh, you should speak to so-and-so, you should speak to so-and-so. And I was getting frustrated with the whole thing. And finally, I spoke to somebody that I thought, you know, why am I talking to this guy? Um, it turned out to be a fellow at a company called Amp Control in Newcastle. He said, oh, you know, we could use something just like that. We're putting a, a high current DC rectifier in the copper refinery up in Townsville and we need a product just like that. And it was totally out of the blue and we thought, you know, why would you want to buy it from a company that's four guys that have nothing? You know, we, we knew how to make these. We never sold them before. Uh, and these guys were willing to take that chance, lay their money down and buy the product from us. John, just, sorry, did you have a proper company at that point? Yes. We, did. Yeah, we had to form an SDO so that we could get the intellectual property license in our name. Okay. Yeah, so that was sort of just on the previous to this slide. Okay. Yeah. What was the size of your first contract? Uh, I think it was around $25,000. Yeah. So we sold two um, hyper and DC measuring systems to Extrata for their copper refinery, um, around $12,000 each. Uh, fairly well below the uh, recommended retail price, 
but we are pretty keen to get a customer uh, to get a sale. What was the old family take on the pay for the tax? Was there anything on the market? Yeah, the alternative technology based on all effect sensors. Um, so generally they form a, a structure which is um, magnetic coils. We have all effect sensors in gaps between them. So in, in a small one it might be four coils with all effect sensors in corners, or a big one it might be you know, 16 of these coils with all effect sensors. And Basically, we run a current through the coil to try and zero out the magnetic field at the hollow sensor. So it's basically forming a, a pseudo integral of the magnetic field around that conductor. So the, the current that they run through these coils to null out the field at the, at the measurement point is proportional to the current through them. So, what was your value proposition in terms of cost and performance? Well, we came in, came in cheaper than the conventional one, of course, because we really underpriced ourselves. Um, if I paid, if I am oh, maybe a factor of three, the, the conventional ones were probably about thirty thousand dollars. So, yeah. Um, <coughs> these guys were, were interested in new technology. They saw benefits in, in terms of how how easy it was to install. They had problems with their conventional equipment uh, failing. Uh, it, Use up a lot of power to big, heavy, you know, useful issues. Um, so then, I guess the second coincidence was after we had sold this system to Strata via amp control in Newcastle, Peter Jansen, angel investor number one, said, Hey, you know, the CEO of Amp Control has just retired, paid him a big fat payout, sold all his equity, and he's looking to invest in people. That sounds ideal. Can you introduce us to him? He says, yeah, I sit right next to him at all these uh, government, you know, mini. Okay, fine. So we got introduced to uh, Neville Sawyer, and he is now our chairman, and he was our eighth investor number two. So again, it was a bit coincidental. Um, Worked out very well for us. So at that point, then we, we realized, well, Neville can fund the company for a while, but we really need something more. Let's start going around and doing the real the tour of all the virtual venture capital companies. That's really it. And so we proceeded on to do a, a, a tour of all the VCs. Now, out of that period, and sort of extract a few bits of wisdom. Uh, the first one is leave no stone unturned. So those calls that I made that eventually ended up speaking to somebody that wanted to buy a current sensor, you know, I, I thought I was completely wasting my time. And it turned out that that was another one of the catalysts that got SDO going. So I think when you're in this business, you basically need to investigate every opportunity. And again, you know, the first thing you have to sell it to may not be the person you set it to sell to. So I think again, you need to investigate every opportunity. And finally, my conclusion is that a customer is more valuable than the best business plan. Now, this doesn't mean that you shouldn't write a business plan. They're obviously very valuable. But I think if you go to a venture capital company with an excellent business plan, or you go to them with a mediocre business plan and a few customers are willing to actually put down cash, buy your product, that's a better proposition. And for us, that sale to Extrata was really the catalyst that said, okay, these guys have something that customers are interested in paying money for. And that just flicked the switch. So we went through all the VCs in Australia. Uh, Ended up speaking to one in particular, got a term sheet, and we sat down and looked at this term sheet and pulled it over for quite some time and took the very brave step of saying, no, nah, we're not interested in that. Um, we had uh, angel investor number two who had some cash. He was a patient investor, he knew the market, and we said to him, look, 
you'd be happy if we just tried to go go alone here, try and build organically, grow organically. Uh, we're not happy with the terms we've got from this venture capital company. Um, all sorts of nasty, you know, preferential shares, uh, things that we we did not live with. And he says, "Yeah, that's good. Let's do it." So we uh, we turned them down. And so you know, the venture capital. Venture capital company had all sorts of terms. They wanted us to hire a, a CEO that had an MBA and pay him lots of money. Uh, they wanted us to, you know, ramp up our marketing budget by a you know, factor of five or ten. And all these things, we were saying that's not right. You know, um, our market. We understand the market pretty well. We understand that it's going to take time for them to sort of adopt the technology. Throwing money at it, which is a typical VC model, is not going to get us there. And so we didn't feel comfortable with that. So I think the advice here is that if you've been working in this business for 10 years, you know it better than that VC does. Um, so you know, take, take on the advice, but make sure that you, you know, distill it and, and only accept what, what you really believe in. And then finally, you've got to make sure that if you are taking investment, that the characteristics of that investor match the characteristics of your company. So in our case, you know, two of the years we've been working with the utilities in this market, we, we understood that they move very slowly, that it's not going to be a, a make 10 times your money in five years sort of business, and this is what the venture capital companies aim to do. So if we, if we go along with their investment, um, we're probably all going to be unhappy in five years. You know, the, all their nasty terms and the terms people have kicked in, uh, you know, we'll be washed out, they won't make any money, whatever. But it's, it's just going to be a bad situation. So, bravely we said no. And I think, again, that was a very important step in uh, the story of SDO. But just quickly looking at uh, where we are. So, the market for our product primarily is high voltage power transmission systems. So. The people that are transmitting power at or above 100 kV. And in New South Wales, that's transmit. In Queensland, that's power link. So it's basically one per state. So in Australia, we have you know, six customers. So these guys, uh, you know, high voltage power transmission equipment. Australian VCs <coughs> have never invested in that market, don't know anything about it. That was a, an issue that we had. You know, they, were, they were a little bit uncomfortable with that. Characteristic of this market, very conservative. You know, their, their main performance objectives are to maintain a network which is 99.99% reliable. So if you've been using something for 40 years that's done that, why would you try new technology? And that's, that's, that is our big fight for SDO, is to convince these people that new technology has benefits. And that does not then sit with the venture capitalists who typically want a high return on their investment in five to seven years. We're also involved in sort of light manufacturing, uh, building our, our sensors, although there's you know, optics inside, theatrical enclosure, has to be fairly rugged, it has to withstand hundreds of thousands of amps. So it's not exactly uh, simply optical fiber manufacturing. And most VCs in Australia, anyway, say, uh, let's make an internet widget. Um, let's make some sort of biotech thing. Manufacturing, don't like that. You're actually, you're actually going to make something? You must be joking. Yeah. And to be honest, we got the same thing from, uh, from Sydney University at one point. You know, you actually want to manufacture something? Why don't you just license it? You know? We don't want to manufacture things. So, it's not a good sign for Australian manufacturing. So this takes us to, uh, pretty much to the end of, of our story. Um, after uh, we, we basically turned down the venture capital offer, uh, we then managed to acquire a second customer, Rio Tinto. We're looking for some interesting systems for their smelter in Boyne Island. Uh, third customer, Nearstar, the smelter down in Hobart. Again, these are all customers that we were looking for. We were looking for the utilities. We found our customers going from the industrial market. 
microlytic processing market has been our main cash flow for the last two years. <coughs> and then more recently, well, more recently, we've got another customer in TransPower New Zealand. This actually is a utility customer and our biggest order to date. Um, but in the, main, in, the, in the middle here, um, we managed to uh, managed to start a relationship with Arteche, which is a Spanish company uh, which is making high voltage power transmission equipment, um, conventional current transformers in particular. Uh, they, they saw what we were making and saw that this is probably the future of this, of this industry for the current measurement. And they didn't want to see their market gone overnight by being displaced by this. And so they said we need a piece of that. So um, I guess a year and a half ago we signed an agreement with Arteche, which gives us access to their distribution networks globally, and they're providing us with, uh, with funding for expansion. So that's a... Uh, John, were there any residual problems with ADB because they had invested in this at various stages on the, on the way along? Have they totally written off what they've been doing with it? There we had a number of concerns about that along the way. Um, they had their name on that patent, that little patent that I mentioned, and that patent was really superseded by CRC 44. Now, we we went to a patent attorney with that, with those two patents, and said, "Look, can you give us a, your advice here whether we actually need that little patent, or do we have freedom to operate without that?" So we had to. Uh, Fund that uh, patent attorney study, and he came back with the, with the uh, judgment that no, we didn't need it. Um, so, you know, there, there, there's no uh, patent intellectual property that is a problem. Uh, know how, I guess, is always a bit of a gray area, but the rule that we had there was well, you know, the four people that are founders of the company have, have know how in their heads, and they don't have to license that. So at the end of the day, we were pretty comfortable that ADD didn't really have any claim on the technology, uh, and our investors have taken the same view. <coughs> yeah, so I guess finally we, we managed to find, uh, well, I guess let's call it an exit strategy for the company, which is what uh, investors like to hear, um, but also a, a funding group which has characteristics that match the characteristics of the market. They're in the market. They understand how fast it moves. They understand that this is going to be a long-term play. They're patient investors. <coughs> and so in that regard, finding this group as uh, strategic investors was a much, much better fit with SDO than the VC company was ever going to be. And so I guess from that point of view, um, a happy ending. So, just look in detail. This is, is our primary product that we're making for the high voltage power transmission market. Basically, the, uh, the optical fiber circuit that I showed before is in, under the lid. The, uh, the current flows through this device and is sort of guided through the, the sensing coils as it travels through here. What's the diameter? Is it about a foot or so? I think uh, from here to here it's about 400 millimeters, 450. Okay. Uh, yeah, oh, okay. <laughs> I can't see it. All right. And it weighs about 19 kilos. So you compare that against the conventional CT, which for the 300 kV market might weigh two and a half tons. It stands about three meters high. So I, I can carry this around in meetings in the boot of my car. You can't do that if you're selling conventional CPs. And the performance is the same. Performance is, is better in a lot of regards. Yeah. Um, again, that 0.2% accuracy specification, which is the de facto standard for conventional CPs, we meet that. But we also have other benefits in terms of being able to measure all the way down to DC. Of frequency, a conventional transformer obviously can't convert DC. Uh, 
uh, we can measure DC equally as well. We can also measure up to about uh, 50 kilohertz. We could go higher, but the way we set up our, our sampling system, that's about the limit. Conventional CT starts to roll off around maybe one kilohertz if you're lucky. So for power quality measurements, measuring harmonics, this is a, a far better device. Uh, it also has no saturation effects. So conventional CT, when the iron core saturates, you get no more output. These, this device will measure ad, ad infinitum. What's the cost now that you have a problem? It's $250,000. Um, this, this device uh, we sell for around $20,000. And the big one, three, the three ton base. Um, that also sells for around twenty thousand dollars at one hundred kV. So as you go to higher voltages, the conventional CTs become very expensive. Um, you can use the same device at any voltage. So we, we become very competitive as the voltage goes up. To the point where nobody will think about using a, a 500 kV device other than this. I think I know what you're thinking is that we should charge more. <laughs> <laughs> and we've had this, had this argument often that uh, you should charge exactly what the conventional CTs are or, or put a premium on them. <laughs> So if uh, 100 kV is 20 k, you should charge 25. And if a 500 kV is uh, 100 k, you should charge 120, even though it's the same device. And I can't, I can't understand how an engineer who knows that this is exactly the same device is going to do that. Me, I'm looking at it from an engineering point of view rather than a marketing point of view. But uh, our, our strategy has been we're selling a based product. You can apply that product at zero volts, at a megavolt, low current, high current, it doesn't matter. It's a one size fits all solution. And then there's an uh, electronics box that sits back in the uh, control room, linked with optical fiber, standard single mode optical fiber, that sensor head. It uh, has a number of uh, different interface types, analog outputs or digital off This is sitting up there in the field up on the top of some big tower. I mean, what are, are the reliability requirements? What do you have to do to keep it sort of uh, performing at the same level for yeah. 20 years? Well, we've only been in operation now for four or five years. So um, if you believe the optical component manufacturers, the lifetimes of those devices, I mean, we're, we're using standard, standard optical couplers, uh, standard optical fiber, other than the spun high light fiber. Um, the, the lifetime that those manufacturers quote for their devices is 50 years, 60 years, 70 years, it's pretty high. Um, so, you know, we can say that's, that's our lifetime, but until you actually prove it, Yes. But we are contending against conventional CTs that they say have a lifetime of 40 years. So they really don't want to go up and take these out of service. The electronics, on the other hand, uh, it's very difficult to make any electronic box that has more than a 10 year lifetime. But because this is in the control room where you have access to it, and you don't have to take the entire network of service, then that's, that's acceptable. And finally, we've uh, managed to rearrange that same technology into another device, which is a, a portable system. So in this case, we have a suitcase that contains all the same electronics and optics. The sensing coil is contained in a ruggedized cable. And this device can be used in, uh, in these high current DC applications for diagnostics or for calibration of existing systems. So this is something that uh, one would find in the world. Nobody else can make anything like this. Uh, you know, disconnect the fiber at this end, throw it over your bus bar, reconnect it, and you measure exactly what's flowing from that bus bar. So it's like a giant clamp on here. The 
but we've had those devices in service with Rio Tinto measuring up to uh, it was 240 cows next. Basically, unlimited. And a few <coughs> examples of uh, so this is the, the very first system we sold to Extrata. This is uh, going to a copper refining process where they have copper anodes plating out the copper onto a copper cathode. They do that by sending 30,000 amps around to this giant tank room, which has some nasty electroly electrolyte solution inside. And they want to be able to measure that current for feeding back to their control system. They, they need to know how many amps generate how many kilos of copper <coughs> for their efficiency calculations. And so they want to know that current pretty accurately. So that's in Townsville. This is uh, going on in the shelter in Gladstone. In this case, they had uh, wanted to expand their capacity. They wanted to expand their uh, high voltage network outside the plant, but they had no room to put in conventional CTs. And so they said, okay, we fit optical CTs in here. And so they managed to, to squeeze them in, uh, basically suspended from the existing structure, and this way they didn't take up any room in the substation. So this, this is another benefit of the optical technology. <coughs> This is uh, just west of Brisbane, uh, Powerlink, Braemar substation. Again, this is another pilot plant that uh, they're evaluating the technology. This one uh, with our colleagues in Spain. And again, with our colleagues in Spain who have good access to the uh, Latin American market, this is in Mexico. This is at a, a very large hydroelectric dam uh, down towards Guatemala. And this is uh, 500, about well, 410 kV. So these are enormous. This, this is a this is a conventional CT, and that's our CT up there. So in comparison. Okay. Excuse me. I thought there was a power utility customer in Zoom now. Yes. Yeah. Transpower. Yep. Yeah. So there's no installations in New Zealand? Uh, we have sold them the units, but they haven't have yet installed them. Uh, their commissioning date is, I think, February of next year. Yeah. So that's probably our, our sort of biggest system to date. They're putting in uh, four three phase systems for uh, an underground cable protection system. Which is quite exciting for us. The rest of these have basically been trials, uh, with the exception of the Rio Tinto system, where it's a, a live system that's protecting their network. But the rest of the trials, but this new field one is, is a real live, they're, they're relying on this for protection of the network application. So it takes on a, a whole new level of uh, importance, built a new level of credibility for SDO. You've got to have huge redundancy built into this system. I mean, can it tolerate being down for? You know, a fraction of a second or, or any, any time. It always happens. It's got to be up front at any time. Um, we don't put redundancy into it, but our customers require redundancy in their networks. So this is a discussion we're having with them right now, is how much redundancy do we need? Do we need to duplicate everything? Do we need to give you one sensor that's got double optical circuits inside of it? Or are you happy with one sensor, one optical circuit, but two electronics boxes? Uh, and, and so there's a lot of different options there. And trying to understand what their requirements are and, and sort of where to draw that line is, is a topic that's very important for us right now. But most protection systems have a completely separate um, X and Y protection. And, and some groups like Transgrid in New South Wales require that the X and the Y protection systems come from completely different manufacturers and you have completely different algorithms. You know, they just, these guys are uh, over the top as far as they're... My, my final question is, is this self-calibrating or does it need external calibration in itself? It does need a, a calibration. Um, the, the fiber that we use in the sensor head uh, can vary by sort of 5% for the sensitivity to current depending on the, the spin pitch and, and fire frequency in it. So we do need to calibrate each one um, yeah, sensitivity. Once the calibration is done, it's 
fit for life. Selling in the New Zealand market, would, would your device have warned them about that catastrophic failure of the end of Auckland and when they lost the power in the central city? Or, you know, I mean, can, can you actually be one of the current and most of some of the solution? Um, it's hard to say if, if we could do that any better than a conventional CT. Uh, I think it really depends more on having the, the intelligence after this. I mean, we're, we're just a transducer. We can tell you whatever current's going through your network, then you do whatever you want with that measurement. So if you have the appropriate intelligence after that to say that you know there's a problem with your network because of leakage or because of imbalance or instability, I think a lot of the interest in New Zealand is uh, because of the, the seismic activity. Uh, obviously, these devices are, are relatively immune to that. A conventional CT, which is uh, made of porcelain uh, and oil filled, uh, is a pretty rich device, uh, pretty heavy, and doesn't withstand a lot of shaking. When do your patents expire and was anyone worried about that date? Uh, absolutely, and we're still worried about it. I think the date on the very first patent was 1993. I think that's due to expire in 2013, so there's not a lot of time left there. Is it, it's 20 years now, is it? 20 years. I think it's 20 years. Um, and then the second one, 1744, <coughs> gives us another almost uh, 10 years of work. So the challenge for us is to keep innovating, keep developing new uh, intellectual property protection. And is anyone it, else, I mean, what the issue there is you can continue to develop and commercialize, but you've got nothing to stop someone else. Is someone else seriously going to go away and develop a private-based sensor? Are there other groups around the world who are thinking about this? We, we just submitted a trial system to the state grid of China research lab uh, for evaluation. Uh, they, they invited manufacturers to submit samples and 16 companies provided samples for them. I think of which 14 were Chinese. Based so, on similar technology. We don't know. They're going to report that to me, aren't they? Possibly. And it's not back in China anymore. Uh, we have a, a third page, which I haven't included here, which SDO has developed since it's become SDO. And that is, has been applied for in China, but the other ones have been. So you reckon on that 14 or 16, some of those are fiber but the sensors, current sensors? Well, there's definitely some fiber based on it, yeah. And we're unsure what the technology is. Uh, it's probably more likely to be near to our competitors. Did you have to follow up sales contracts with the service contract? Generally not. Um, most of the utilities like to do their own service to these systems. So they, they expect us to teach them how to use them, how to service them, and then they're quite happy, happy to do that themselves. Most of your technology is on sound. It's based on well, standard electronics and standards of communications products, except for the smart Wi-Fi forever. How sort of exposed are you to the fact that there's a small number of manufacturers in that world? That's certainly our biggest concern in terms of the supply of, of components. And at the moment, we really only have one supplier. Uh, and we're trying continually to uh, negotiate an agreement with them which sort of locks us into a, a strong relationship um, and at the same time we're exploring who else might be able to supply it. Uh, that's that's for us. 
what's the best case scenario here in terms of global impact, size of the market, every power station around the world wants one of these? Because where are you going to be in five, ten years? The global market for CT is about 100 kV. It's about a billion dollars a year. So in terms of venture capital interest, that's sort of the threshold, really. Most DCs won't invest in anything in the market less than 500 million, I think. So we're sort of per annum. Per annum. Yeah. So we're sort of on the fifth hour in the road is like less than that. They're being well supported by the they were well I don't understand. No, but what is not not how much market they have, but what the global market for that they have half of the market. Yeah. Okay. I don't know, my, my, what I was told was that around $500 million a year per annum globally is when the VCs start getting invested. Below that, it's just too small for their. Well, I imagine that's when they get really interested. So this is about a billion dollars a year per annum. Year per annum. Globally. And you have a, a possible, you can possibly get a good market on the share of that. Um, yeah, we, our Spanish colleagues, our cache, have a, a very good relationship with the South American market. They have already about 80% of Argentina, about 50% of Brazil, about 90% of Mexico. So presumably we could follow up with you know, equivalent numbers. Um, they also are strong in parts of Europe, but you know, we have very strong competition in terms of maybe DEC, but it's the Riva, who are the big ones. Have you know their own home markets, a lot more Americans. So, uh, you know, if we could get to uh, I mean, ten percent of the world market, that would be fantastic. Considering they were at point zero 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 one percent. So, so is it just the conservatism of the industry that's working against you? Uh, yeah, I think so. Yeah. Um, we, we went and made a presentation to PowerLink in Queensland, um, through the, again, the high voltage power transmission authority. And they were really enthusiastic after our meeting. And they said, this is fantastic. We really like this. Um, we're going to fast track this technology. So instead of being in our seven year capital acquisition plan, it's going to be in our three year capital acquisition plan. You know, that's what fast tracking means for them. So well, they said, we to survive for another three years before we sell them. But again, this focuses, focuses on how important it is to have an investor that has that same, uh, same tolerance, that same patience.